So it's chipped it, sure it's chipped it, but that's a fence post and this is leather. Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today we're back with the Lockdown Longbow and Boiled Leather. <coughs> leather Armour, Queer Boulet. Sorry French people, I just killed that word, I know. I'll say at the beginning, a lot of this is my supposition and my guesswork. So if you know that I'm wrong or if you think I'm wrong, just remember, even if I sound like I'm adamant, I'm not certain, but I think I'm right. It's stiff. There we go. I'll give you a good close up. It's shiny because of the process. I'll explain that. And same with the discoloration. It's definitely hard. And that is four millimeters, four mil thick. So what is going on? Well, there's a lot to unpack here and there's a little bit of sort of material science. So we're all going to head back to school, but you know, I'll make it good. I'll make it the way school should have been. So I've got myself a piece of veg tanned leather here, the same thickness as this, to give you some sort of an example. It's flexible. You can do all of that. It's fine. Does it make good armour? Well, let's just have a look. I've got my piece of veg tanned leather here and I've got a block of foam and a Todd Cutler rondel dagger. It's the pointiest one that I sell. Now, if you do want to support this channel, buying the Todd Cutler range of products, it's a good way to start because that really helps me and it helps fund all this stuff I'm doing. So rondel dagger, it's meant to be an armour penetrator. We've got four mil of veg tanned leather here. Let's just see what it does. Oh, there you go. I think that fairly convincingly goes through. Well, perhaps no great surprise, but let's explain what's going on. Now, hardened leather, there's lots of speculation about how it was done, whether it was treated with wax, whether it was with oils, whether it was with water and so on. But the problem is the name is boiled leather, queer boule. So the assumption has to be that it is boiled leather, but this is the problem. It can't be boiled leather. It can be all sorts of things, but it cannot be boiled leather, even though that's what it's called. So this is leather that I have boiled and look at it. This started as flat sheets. It's hard as you like, hard as you like, but there you go. Ah, I can just crack it. There we go. And I've broken it. It's really hard, but it's deformed. You can't make sheets of armour out of this stuff. So it's not boiled leather, right? That we have now discovered. So what is it? Well, you can see the manuscript pictures and there's like sort of big vats, steaming vats. So I think the assumption is that it's something to do with heat. Well, yeah. So I got to thinking one day, I landed a TV job where somebody said, can you do boiled leather? And I just went, yeah, of course I can do boiled leather. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. So of course I put the phone down. And it's like, oh no. Boiled leather, right, what is it? And I got to thinking, and I went back to a conversation I had with Peter Jonsson, the great swordsmith and designer, and he was talking about sword grips pressing the glue through the leather and it becoming impregnated and becoming almost like fiberglass. And I thought that conversation, I just went, that's it, that is it. So what's fiberglass? Well, there is a point to this. Fiberglass is glass fibers, All right? There you go, glass fibers. In a mat, it's flexible, you can do that, it doesn't crack very thin that's why you mix it with resin polyester or epoxy resin which is brittle so that's rubbish on its own the glass is rubbish on its own you put the two together and the resin fills the gaps between the glass and you end up with something incredibly strong because these fibers are really strong in tension so i thought well it's like fiberglass but obviously it's not so you have the leather which is fibrous you can see that when you rip it apart it's full of fibers so the idea is you fill the gaps between the fibers with basically a resin that resin if it is brittle it is hard and incompressible and combined with the fibres you end up with something tough. There are really important characteristics about boiled leather, the way it can be decorated, the way it can be moulded and shaped for van braces and breastplates and, and little tiny pen cases and all sorts of things that use boiled leather that means that it has to have a very specific set of properties. One of those is that you must be able to mould it but then there's too much decoration on to do it while it's there. It takes days to do that level of decoration so you must be able to sort of bring it back it's not like heating the surface and hardening it. You must be able to soften it again to decorate it and then let it reharden. And I thought of all these different things about the way it had to work and I thought it's animal glue. So then what you do is when it's warm, you put it over your mold and as it cools, the jelly hardens. It is jelly, jello. It hardens, the leather takes its set and then it dries over the next weeks and you end up with something that is like wood and that is our material science story. But the thing is, all of this is gonna come true again when we talk about the Gamson, because a lot of this happens the same way. So I'll just show you. I have got a regular bit of Gamson here, nice and flexible, 32 layers of linen. And then I have a much stiffer wine and salt impregnated Gamson. 
We're going to come to that in another film, but the process is the same, that you are filling up those gaps, those intercees between the fibres with something. In this case, wine and salt. In the other case, animal glue. I can't say for a fact, not a fact, that I'm right, but in my head, I'm certain that I am. But it means also, because I can't say it for a fact, we don't have a recipe about it. We don't know how this stuff was really made, so there is experimentation to be done. And I've made a batch of stuff here where I think maybe the jelly was too strong. And so what has happened is we've ended up with something that has removed a lot of the toughness, but left brittleness, like a knife that is over hard. But I'm gonna give you an example here. Look at this. That is a piece of leather, okay? Leather and jelly. This is a fence post. Check this out. That is not something that you see every day. Leather chops fence post. So it's chipped it, sure it's chipped it, but that's a fence post and this is leather. So that is the end of our material science lecture. So what are we actually gonna go and shoot? Well, we've got one layer, two layer, and three layer pieces of hardened leather. And you can hear they are hard. Let's shoot them. Back at the range with the lockdown longbow and a single layer of hardened leather. Let's see what it does. Type seven needle bogkin. Right, well that is straight through, straight through. So I don't think there's any point in doing any of the other arrows on that one. So we will go up thickness and we'll see how we go. It's actually, it's cracked right across. So maybe I cooked up my mix a bit wrong, you know, like I say, no recipe, but you know, it's stopped it. Hell, actually, you know what? Let's just try a type nine just because. Goodness. Okay, well that also straight through. Uh, cracked it, whole chunk fell off. So clearly, single layer, hardened leather, or at least with that recipe, no good at all. We're now gonna go for two layers of hardened leather. So this is about eight to nine millimeters of leather. And of course, jelly, or if you're in the States, jello. The magic ingredient. Type seven needle bodkin. Ooh. Straight in, but the penetration, not so good. And that is a needle bodkin. Let's just try with the type nine. Again, oh, killed it. Right, well I better go and correct that one then, didn't I? Again, oh. Now then, getting interesting. So here, needle bogkin type seven, it's cracked the surface. I mean, it's absolutely shattered it. So that says to me that my inexpertise at making hardened leather has just made this a bit too brittle and not quite tough enough. You know what? Experience would change that. This one, type nine, has not cracked it. But again, if we now look at the backside of these, they're coming through. The foam does stop it, does slow it, but it's not massive. It's not a massive game changer to it. What is interesting is that two layers is making a difference. That is beginning to make a significant difference to how these things penetrate. So we're going to try with three layers. Let's see what happens. Right, here we go again. I'm going to start this time with the Type 16 to see if that makes a significant difference uh, to how it goes through. And then we're going to swap into the others. Anyway, I don't know why I wanted to mix it up. Well, that one's straight in, but it doesn't look like the leather's cracked. Type 9, let's see if it can do its business. Well, if Type 16 does, I'm guessing this will. Let's find out. Well, that's stuck in. Towton or Tudor Bodkin. Last up, Type 9. We're there, four clean shots. Let's go have a look. This promises to be interesting. I, I love these tests, I just love them. Now clearly all four have penetrated. Question mark is how deeply? So I'm just gonna mark them off and then we'll pull the target off and we'll have a look what's, what's going on. Here you go, this is an unpacking video for you. And there we are. Let's give you a sense of scale. There is my hand. So that's not nice. The other ones, again, you know, not very pleasant. Type 16, actually, that's interesting. It fared less well than all of the others, which I wouldn't have expected. Um, that is intriguing, that is intriguing. But all of them have really been caught and bound by this leather. And this is, 
you know, three layers. There's nothing to stop you doing four or five layers. So I'm back at base and we'll have a look at what's happened today. Uh, again, I just love this series of tests because these are things I haven't done either and I've wondered about. So yeah, hardened leather, did it work? Well, yeah, it did. So let's just have a look. So clearly one sheet of hardened leather to my recipe, whether that's right or wrong, it went straight through and actually fractured the leather. So not very good. Two pieces of hardened leather. So that is about eight millimeters thick and needle bodkin is penetrating from back of the leather to end of the point, 23 centimeters. Type nine, back of the leather to the end of the point, 15 centimeters. But then let's go and have a look at the three layers. Three layers, needle bodkin, this time 11 centimeters. Short bodkin, eight centimeters. And this one, I ran the Towton Tudor head, uh, six and a half centimeters, and the type 16, five centimeters. Now that's interesting. Now this armor type is not particularly heavy, but throughout history, armor, men seem to wear roughly the same weight of armor. They're prepared to wear roughly the same weight of armor. And so I couldn't tell you exactly how heavy a breastplate made of this should be, but actually if you did it all at three layers of leather and then maybe on the front you upped it to four or five, I can see that being completely viable as a piece of armor. Can they make it? Yes, I've showed you how you can make it, how you can do exactly this. You can mold it, you can shape it, you can decorate it, you can do all the stuff that you want with it. And it is pretty darn resistant to arrows. Four layers, would this have gone through? Maybe marginally, five? I think it probably wouldn't. There's one more thing we're gonna do. We're gonna go back to my stab test with the rondel. So these are gonna take some getting out. So we're gonna break and I'll be back in a minute. I've removed the arrows from the two ply piece and we're gonna go for the stab test again with the Todd Cutler Rundle. Remembering these are all available and they really do help support the channel buying these things. <clears throat> so that's penetrated about a centimeter. Good defense. So, you know, anybody who says hardened leather is not good, they're wrong. We'll try that again with a three ply, just see what we do. And that one, maybe about six millimeters through. So again, that one without a doubt is not a killing blow. Well, nor is the other one. Um, neither of them are. <sighs> They're gonna hurt a bit. So what have we learned about boiled leather, cure boule, and arrows? Well, one thing we learned is I can't pronounce it. I've given you a recipe and a methodology that I am almost certain is how they did it. If it is done that way, it works. It works pretty well as a three ply, but arrows can still poke through. We saw that as a four ply, I doubt it. Five ply, almost certainly not. Actually, you know what? Let's go back to the range. I'm gonna set this up with the five layers and we're gonna see what happens. Cause you know what? They would have protected the front of their breastplate because a normal steel breastplate or iron breastplate was thicker at the front for exactly the reason that's where the shots tend to come from. So scratch this, there's gonna be a conclusion to the conclusion. Let's go shoot stuff. I just had to shoot this, I, I, I need to know. So we've got five layers of hardened leather, according to my recipe. Type 7 needle bodkin. Well, it's through. Type 9 plate cutter, short bodkin, call it what you will. And that's through as well. Let's do two more just because. So we've got another type 9. Ooh. That's annoying. Type seven. Let's go have a look. Oh, I'm slightly annoyed. I was sort of hoping that they were going to bounce off, but they didn't. But anyway, how far did they go in? Ah, I'm not annoyed anymore. I'd love to show you, but I'm not. Let's take it back to base and we'll have a look there. And here we are for the great reveal. Five layers of hardened leather. The Type 9s went through 30 millimeters and 28 millimeters. Type 7 needle bodkin, uh, 78 millimeters and 65 millimeters. And there we have it. Type 9 needle bodkins, well, slender point, but you know, you're not gonna be happy if you get that in the chest. These ones, clearly you're not gonna be happy, but you'd almost certainly live from those. You might even have other padded garments underneath, who knows? Again, what's interesting here is that these are bent. Well, don't forget, most arrowheads, we have no evidence that they were made of steel. So they would have been wrought. And wrought is 
softer than this really these are mild steel that i'm using in this case so bending arrowheads like that there's nothing wrong with that that's just a realistic result to hitting something that is really quite hard indeed and there we go boiled leather can't tell you they made it like this but i'm pretty sure they did if they did make it like this would it work yes it would so what I'm going to do now, actually, is I'm just going to remove the arrowheads and I'm going to weigh this sample. I've got a breastplate, I'll calculate the areas, and I will tell you how heavy I think a breastplate would be were it to be made of this material on the front surface and thinner on the sides. 500 grams for that piece. So bearing in mind it's there, I think that you could probably do a three-ply breastplate with a five-ply reinforcement on the front for around about two and a half, possibly three kilos. So around about six to seven pounds something like that. Boiled leather, right good protection. See you next time for another Lockdown Longbow. Dunno, maybe gambesons, maybe male, who knows?